All right, it's a little after four, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Chuck Hawkins. I'm going to introduce our speaker today. Probably most of you were here yesterday, so I'm not going to do the long intro. I'll do the short intro uh, so we can get right into uh, Leroy's talk. Uh, yesterday, Leroy talked to us about essentially stream hydrology from an aquatic ecologist's point of view. Uh, today, he's going to talk to us about thermal biology of, I think, aquatic insects, um, comparing temperate and tropical systems. Um, Leroy is professor in biology at Colorado State University. He also has an appointment at the University of Canberra um, in Australia. Um, one of the reasons we brought him in is uh, he's had a really uh, large impact on the stream ecology community. He has a bozillion uh, publications and, and citations. And as a consequence, he's been appointed uh, or elected as a fellow of AAAS, the Ecological Society of America and the Society for Freshwater Science. Uh, so without further ado, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce you uh, once again to Leroy Pop. Thanks, Chuck. Can you hear me okay in the back there? Okay, a little bit, need to be a little bit louder today, I just said. Uh, well, first of all, let me say I've had a really great time here. Met a lot of people doing cool stuff and it seems like a really great community for graduate students and faculty as well, probably. I don't want really to go too far there, uh, but uh, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure to be here. So thanks for the invitation. Uh, and I want to make one correction to my opening slide. Sorry to have you guys down as a center for ecology. I understand it's the ecology center. And that's spelled correctly. The little center is spelled correctly, right? <laughs> All right. So today I'm going to talk about some work, some of the most interesting work that I've done over my career. It was a five-year project in Ecuador and Colorado with a really great team of biologists, mostly from evolutionary biologists to physiologist and ecologist. Uh, and these are the two mountains we uh, in Ecuador uh, here, rainforesty, sort of mid-elevation, Colorado, so it looks like Utah and many places. So uh, there's a uh, let me get in let me get into this. And this um, this project was sort of this was a uh, driven by this question about bio, uh, biodiversity loss and vulnerability of species to warming. And as we know, there's a, um, you know, species are vulnerable to climate warming, either maybe from a variety of sources, stressors, physiologically, uh, habitat loss, poor dispersal ability in order to move and, in, in you know, as, as localities warm small population sizes, variety of factors that interact. I'm using two things here, so I gotta get, my brain has to figure that out. Uh, and there's also an interesting question about whether the, uh, you know, if tropical diversity, really biodiverse systems are more or less vulnerable to warming than temperate systems, okay? This is an ongoing uh, issue of great interest and concern. Uh, and for this project, well, so this just shows that the sort of, you know, gradient of biodiversity sort of, you know, and we see that there's a clearly more by, you know, the tropical regions are more biodiverse and particularly uh, mountain, mountains in the tropics are hot spots. And uh, we'll sort of get into that a little bit, but, uh, you know, this so, uh, the, the objective of the study was to look at particular taxa, in this case, aquatic insects, to see if, the, you know, A, are they more diverse in, in the uh, tropics? It turns out, because of taxonomic uncertainty, uh, it really wasn't known whether or not tropical systems are more biodiverse with respect to aquatic insects than temperate zone systems where there's been a lot more taxonomic work done. So that was one of the uh, interests in this project. And this work was inspired by an, uh, uh, 
some, uh, uh, an idea put forth a long time ago, but it's, the, the citation rate for this paper is rapidly increasing again. So this was a really important idea uh, present, uh, put forth by Dan Jansen, whoops, who was at the University of Pennsylvania, I believe at the time, uh, about called the climate variability hypothesis, which basically uh, purport, uh, hypothesizes that the seasonal climatic variation and elevation shape the physiological adaptations and physiological responses of, of organisms uh, and ex uh, it can explain their distribution and diversity, okay? So this is a really simple hypothesis, but it contains a very profound idea that the range of variation in temperature that, an or that a species or organisms receive over their lifespan, that evolutionary history conditions their, uh, their sensitivity to temperature change, okay? So clearly there are some big differences here between the temperate zone and the tropical zone in terms of this sort of range of climatic variation. So this work uh, is often invoked to explain tropical diversity, particularly with respect to mountains in the, in the tropics. And that's what this study is going to look at in terms of, in, we're going to look at the, this idea in fairly good detail. So we got this uh, NSF funding with uh, several, there were seven PIs on this project uh, from different universities. The, uh, the Ecuadorans here were not, they were just, they were not allowed to be PIs, but they were equally, a couple of those were equally involved in this work. So we had a, a large team, okay? I had the pleasure of being the lead PI. So <laughs> there's a lot of, I, I learned a lot about managing other uh, co-PIs in this project. And we had a great team uh, that included uh, people from CSU, myself, Boris Kondratiev, the late Boris Kondratiev, Chris Funk, Cameron Gallimbar, then uh, Alex Flecker from Cornell and Kelly Zamudio, so, uh, evolutionary herpetologist from Cornell, now, now at University of Texas, Steve Thomas from Nebraska, and did I leave anyone out? Oh yeah, Andrea from uh, USFQ and uh, Juan Guayasamin also. So it was a really interesting team. Here we are standing in the, par the Paramo zone of the Andes at about 4,000 meters. So. It was my first time working in the tropics. It was really pretty amazing. Okay, so this was very integrative work. Okay, and even though we were all biologists, uh, we had you know different trainings, different interests, and different vocabularies and sort of perspectives on things. So it took us a long time to actually reach a consensus of how we talked about things and what we meant by integration. All right, so let's get into some of the uh, details here. So if we look at temperature, so we're basically interested in the question of how does temperature variation and temperature warming, which we did experimentally as well, how does that influence the sense, how does that influence the vulnerability of uh, aquatic species to potential further warming? Now, if we look at the temperature in the tropics, uh, tropical streams or even, you know, terrestrial systems, it's always warm at low elevation. We're working at basically zero degrees latitude. So it's, you know, it's always warm at low elevation. It's always cold at high elevation. And it's sort of like a, you know, uh, a jelly cake or whatever, you know, but so it's always warm down here and always cold up there. Uh, and unlike trop temperate systems, we have this very big seasonal swings, right? Where it's, colder at higher elevations, but we have, have it's in warmer at lower elevations, but we have a big seasonality so that there's a lot more overlap in the thermal regimes between high and low elevations, right? So I wasn't quite sure how to represent that in terms of a baked product or a jello product. So I just chose a German chocolate cake, which, you know, we get to sort of hints at the more snow and the higher elevations, but there's pretty more homogenized temperature regime. Okay, a more or less variable between elevations. And that's sort of the foundation for 
you know, the predictions that come out of Janssen's hypothesis. So in the temperate streams in Colorado, we expect a species to have a broad thermal niche. There's gonna be, uh, they're gonna be reduced cost to dispersal. Uh, so if, if species in the tropical, in the temperate zone have a, you know, sort of urethermic, have a broader temperature uh, exposure, then it's not gonna cost much to disperse. There's not local adaptation to the thermal regime, right? Because they have a wide range. Um, high gene flow, therefore, low, low speciation rates. Those are all sort of predictions from the model, from the idea. And then by, in contrast, tropical species would have a narrow, more narrow thermal niche, depending on what, you know, that reflects the, whatever layer they're living in. Uh, Increased cost of dispersal. If you disperse up the mountain, you experience colder, you know, colder temperatures that you're not adapted to. So there's, uh, you know, predicted to be increased cost of dispersal, low, lower gene flow, and therefore more speciation. And we've seen, you know, these tropical mountain systems have very high, they're sort of diversity hotspots. So the expectation then is that tropical mountains species are physiologic, or tropical mountains are physiologically steeper. Okay. Uh, the, the title of Jensen's paper was really about our mountain, why are tropical mountains higher than uh, physiologically than uh, temperate zone systems. So we uh, wanted to test each of these sort of predictions. So we uh, did thermal sensitivity testing, measuring tolerance of high t of warm temperatures and I'll, I'll come to, to the uh, methods in a moment. Uh, so we looked at thermal sensitivity and growth rate experimentally. We looked at growth rate of, of, of tropical species. The other, the, the idea of gene flow, uh, we tested that by looking at uh, population genetic structure across these you know, elevation zones uh, and sort of the range limits of species, okay? Oops, uh, we actually looked at speciation as well, sort of using model to see whether, uh, you know, well, yeah, whether or not there were uh, speciation rates different across the, the uh, tropics and temperate zone, but also we looked at diversity uh, and expected to see, you know, greater diversity in, in the tropics uh, because of this sort of local adaptation. And we used, uh, we did DNA barcoding to discover species. There's a lot of crypt, turns out that's a lot of cryptic species in, uh, in, these, in these tropical streams. And then in terms of gene flow, we did, uh, looked at population genetic structure of uh, isolated populations using what at the time were reasonable genomic tools, but these, these geno genomic tools change very rapidly over time. And we looked at the range limit of species. And then finally, uh, this idea of local adaptation here, uh, we did experimental uh, growth, growth experiments under different temperatures. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this project, okay? And uh, I wanna talk about these results now. So we focused on stream insects because these uh, are you know, they're biodiverse, they're widely distributed, they're important ecologically. Uh, and we know a lot about aquatic insect ecology and, and distribution patterns, okay? Uh, we've really focused on three major groups because they're easier to work with and they're commonly looked at uh, in, in streams around the world. So mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. All right, so we, our work, as I said, was here in Colorado at about 40 degrees north and Ecuador, the Napo region of Ecuador at about uh, zero degrees. So I'll refer to these as temperate streams, top tropical streams, uh, Colorado streams, Ecuadorian streams. Uh, and, but the reality is we really fo we focus on a very small area in Colorado and a very small area in, in Ecuador. So whether, you know, how broadly these results or can be transferred, one might argue with, but I would say that since we're, we're testing basically ev uh, evolutionary 
hypotheses that, that result from evolutionary processes that I think our results can probably be, even though not greatly replicated, if you will, uh, we're looking at physiological responses to temperature. So I think those are pretty generalizable uh, features of this work. Now our study design was uh, to use hydrologically independent tributaries to like this main stem river here. And so uh, to sample those independently, this shows 200 meter elevation uh, gradients. So we basically tried to sample, find tributaries every 200 meters or so that are feeding into this larger river and sample those. So we have discrete populations uh, and that are not hydrologically connected. Of course, there was some very, we couldn't, you know, we didn't have, we didn't have uh, streams at every 200 meters, but we, you know, we tried, we tried to get those as well as we could. Uh, in Colorado, uh, here we, here's Fort Collins, boulders down here. We sampled this area of the front range. You see the elevation gradient here from uh, high to uh, low, whoops. And then Ecuador, the same thing here on the Papayocta, Papayocta drainage and the Oyacachi drainage up here uh, that are uh, tributaries to the, to the in, they're in the Napo River system, okay? So uh, we, uh, and this shows our sampling locations along those elevation gradients. So in Colorado, these are just some, uh, we had a large field crew that, you know, went to, uh, stomped around the mountains of Colorado. And we had another large field crew in Ecuador. Uh, this shows some of the, of the, you know, typical scenery. You're probably pretty familiar with this kind of landscape. Okay. So in Ecuador, a little bit different. Um, whoops! Oh shoot! In the, of course, in Colorado, you get up in the uh, alpine zone, you know, and it's nice and sunny and warm. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, insulation. In Ecuador, the alpine zone, uh, the equivalent is something called the Paramo. It's a, it's a grassland uh, that is above tree line. And you can see there's some really steep stuff here. There's a Antisano. Uh, volcano, still active, and then sort of lower elevate, mid elevations, very steep, uh, and lower elevations, you know, not as steep, but still uh, pretty good flow. Uh, it's a very dynamic landscape. You can see geomorphology happening in, in these streams, and especially in the mid elevations. This, this boulder appeared uh, at right below one of our study sites between sampling times. So we went back once and like, Lucky, luckily, the bridge wasn't taken out, but the sort of mid mid uh, mid elevation areas in the Andes are very active, actively eroding. Okay. Uh, we had to sort of mount an expedition to sample in one of the in the Oyakachi uh, system. So here's our pro program, our project manager Kelly Anderson. There's Chris, and uh, these these are people who went along and. You know, hacked through the jungle and you know, cooked the food and helped with the sampling. So it was. Uh, I didn't make this trip, unfortunately. So one of the basic assumptions is that the temperature is going to vary. The temperature regimes are going to be variable with altitude, depending on these uh, whether you're in the uh, Ecuador or Colorado. So we put loggers in the stream, and in Ecuador, you can see at different elevations, uh, low elevation, fifteen, you know, ten, fifteen degrees. A lot uh, over a seasonal cycle, if you will, we see there's there's variation, most, but that's mostly diel variation. The the the, the temperatures really remain sort of in constant, uh, stable over over a period of time. At the highest elevation, you can see it's colder, and you still get that you know diel variation. Uh, contrasted with Colorado, which as you would expect, we have you know cold winters here. There's the blue is the highest elevation. And it would be cold in the winter. In the summer, we have warmer temperatures down low. But in the winter, we also have these cold, similarly cold uh, temperatures, irrespective of elevation. So organisms living here are, are going to experience pretty constant warm thermal regime over here. Uh, 
organisms living at low elevation in the red are going to experience warm summers and cold winters. And it's pretty similar to what's happening in high elevation as well. So this was just to validate the basic assumption. So let's first talk about this uh, thermal sensitivity of species of the, our mayflies, stoneflies, and uh, caddisflies. And the bulk of the work on this, this question was done in the lab by Alicia Shaw, who was a PhD student at CSU. She's now at Michigan State University. Uh, so she sort of re helped revive an interest in stream thermal physiology, thermal ecology, which has sort of waned for many decades actually um, over the, and so her work has now become very sort of relevant because of the, you know, because of climate change for aquatic organisms. Uh, this just shows the publication, one of the publications that she led on. You can see in, here in the lab, we have uh, both, you know, uh, keep the organisms in uh, their home temperature, ambient temperature from where they came from for a couple of days, then uh, let them acclimate. And then we can experimentally expose them to warmer temperatures to see how tolerant they are and co or colder temperatures. This is just some of the setup here. Uh, and this is just one of our Ecuadorian species here, uh, mayfly and Dcops peruvianus. A uh, little funny story, you know, you expect to see speciation uh, and, you know, species uh, populations being genetically different as you go and morphologically perhaps different as you go up elevation. We first got to Ecuador and this species, morpho species, was basically at every location. So that really doesn't make much sense. Turns out uh, later after genomic analysis, there are like 12 species, okay, as we go up the mountain. So, um, Okay, in Colorado, oops, let me give results. Okay, so uh, what we measured in was uh, two indicators of thermal tolerance. One is the CT max, which simply is you warm the temperature up until the organism no longer responds. And then if you turn the temperature down, it can, it can recover. And that's what's called, you know, it's, it can survive that warming. That's called the CT max. The critical thermal maximum. And what we see in Colorado is that his low elevation here and high elevation, that the tolerance for warm temperatures is higher at low elevation. So it makes sense, right? Because of the sum, summers are hotter at low elevation. Contrasted with um, higher elevations where there's less, less, uh, more, less thermal tolerance, uh, the slower CT max. We also looked at CT min, uh, the sort of the minimum temperature that organisms can recover from being ex briefly exposed to, and there's not much change across elevations here in Colorado. Uh, so these were done, uh, these experiments were done with a, a family of mayflies that are common in both uh, tropical and temperate streams. So we had some sort of phylogenetic control on this, okay? Um, Okay, in Ecuador, we see an opposite pattern, interestingly, where at lower elevations, there's high, uh, no, sorry. Uh, this is similar, low elevations have a higher CT max than high elevations. And it's not, the, the, the pattern is not as pronounced in Ecuador, okay? And with CT men, what we see is that low elevation populations have a very, have a higher, are not as adapted to colder temperatures, right? So they're low elevations, warmer temperatures. And so cold temperatures are more, they're more sensitive to, to, to cold temperatures than they are to warmer temperatures. So at CT men uh, at high elevation, is very low, okay? So they can tolerate colder temperatures at higher elevation. Now, these, these data are really sort of useful in the sense that we can combine CT min and CT max. We can take the difference between them, and that's what we call thermal breadth. And so the idea would be that, uh, you know, the thermal breadth in temperate, temperate systems uh, should be higher because of that seasonal variation than in tropical uh, species, 
because of that uh, more constant uh, you know, temperature exposure. And indeed, we see that there is a sort of Colorado stream, taxa have uh, a, a larger thermal breadth than on average than on Ecuadorian taxa, okay? And if we look at that as a function of elevation, we can further partition some of that variance. And so at tropical elevations, tropical low elevation populations here uh, have a lower thermal breadth and the thermal breadth increases as you go up the mountain, which is sort of interesting. And part of the explanation for that uh, is that these, these low elevation sites are already, the organisms are living very close to their CT max, okay? Uh, for Colorado streams, we see that thermal breadth declines as you go up in elevation. Okay, so we have lower elevations have a broader thermal breadth. And that's because probably they experience that broader range of temperatures on a, over an annual cycle than high elevation. So we have these sort of opposite patterns, which is, you know, very interesting. And uh, sort of as someone who came out of, you know, temperate, perspective, temperate zone perspective, a lot of these results uh, are really eye-opening for me uh, because these tropical systems seem to be operating in a, in a different uh, uh, a different way than, uh, than our temperate streams do. All right, so we sort of validated or showed that this is true. This is what we found. We then wanted to uh, look at dispersal here, okay? And I think it's soon we left out a slide, but what we did was we uh, looked at uh, uh, DNA sequencing to uh, look, look at uh, the genomic changes across elevation. And we genotyped several hundred specimens per site. So that, you know, Chris Funk is very good at genomics. So, you know, we were sure to sort of have a, a, an adequate design to have enough sampling and so forth. Uh, and so I'm not going to go into the details since I don't, I'm not a genomicist and, you know, this is one of the benefits of working with other people who know what they're doing. You can just sort of report our results and, uh, you know, take, take my word for it. Um, so Nick Pilato was a postdoc at Cornell. He led this part of the project. Uh, here we are. So we looked at dispersal. Uh, this dispersal question, we expect uh, hygiene flow, lots of dispersal across elevation in the uh, German chocolate cake versus the um, layer cake here. And we used, we measured uh, population genetic structure of isolated populations up the elevation gradient, okay, uh, using FST. Uh, and we looked at the range limit of species, and part of this involved actually identifying species using, uh, we, uh, we used mitochondrial uh, DNA, the CO1 gene, which was, you know, that's what we, that's how we uh, identified species. So if we look at some of the results, what we see is that we have evidence for reduced dispersal in the tropics. So Ecuador, we have a wide range of uh, you know, FST values with very high values. So a lot of separation between populations, right? Uh, in Colorado, it's more restricted. Then uh, similarly for uh, uh, migrants per generation, which can be calculated from, you know, the data, we have more migration occurring in temperate streams uh, and than in the Ecuadorian streams. So these are consistent with our expectations, right? And if we look uh, at the sort of rad sequence data, what we see here is that we're looking at the, the change, the, uh, the, the spread of uh, genetic, uh, the genetic signal from low elevation up to, uh, well, this doesn't really incorporate elevation explicitly, but what we see is there's more there's more uh, change with uh, uh, genetic differences among populations uh, as we go up in elevation. Okay, so this simply uh, indicates that uh, well, in the temperate zone here, Colorado, it's pretty similar. 
So there's greater genetic divergence with elevation differences in Ecuador than in Colorado. We're seeing that in the sort of spread, okay? Uh, the same is true for stoneflies and for caddisflies, although the pattern is not quite as distinct. So we're seeing uh, re reduced dispersal, presumably across uh, elevation in, in Ecuador and more genetic differentiation between uh, as, as we uh, go, up, go up in elevation. So in terms of species discovery, this work was led by Brian Gill, who's a PhD student at CSU and is now at the US EPA. And uh, we have, we're gonna ask the question of how, bio, how diverse are these tropical streams? And because so many of the, you know, the, so much of the work done in tropical streams is based on morphological taxonomic units or MTUs, it, it appears from, uh, from just the data, you know, published data, that so here's our MTUs, morphological taxonomic units in Ecuador. And we see that in terms of MTUs, the, the temperate zone is, in Colorado is more diverse. Okay. But then once we uh, identify, you know, look at uh, our CO1 results, we see that there's a huge amount of cryptic diversity in the tropical streams that reflects that you know layer cake that uh, speciation uh, or you know diversity is is uh, is very high in the tropics and it's uh, distributed across elevations. So this is the elevational range. So what we see from this is that in in Ecuador, that if we look at the taxonomic data, just MTUs, that these tropical species uh, have uh, you know, a pretty wide range. But once we look at the gen genomics data or the uh, DNA data, we see that we get that more better species resolution, that we have more, each species has a, a, a lower range. And then in the, in the temperate zone in Colorado, it doesn't really matter much between the two. We don't have much cryptic diversity in the streams in Colorado. So, but, so we see that in, in, in tropical streams, we have low range uh, breadths, whereas in the temperate zone, we have much broader range breadths. And that's, again, consistent with the Janssen uh, prediction. And uh, this simply a, a cladogram that shows for tropical, it combines tropical and uh, temperate zone streams. And what we see is that there's, in general, the, the uh, yellow bars are smaller than the blue bars, more restricted elevation. But this is not really sort of a phylogenetically dependent kind of relationship necessarily. There's sort of an even spread of that dis disparate, disparate elevation range uh, across both climate zones. All right, so our findings basically uh, conform to our expectations. So this is all working out really nicely. I mean, this is, you know, sort of, it was a real pleasure to see these results uh, turn out as they did because they sort of, you know, they validated Janssen's uh, hypothesis as well as sort of, our, you know, what our intuition, once we understand how the, you know, the temperature distributions vary between tropical and temperate zone streams. So this, this study, I would say, is probably one of the best empirical validations of the Janssen's hypothesis predictions. Uh, it's one of the few, I mean, a lot of, a lot of things published, but this, in this study, we actually collected the data using rigorous repeatable methods and so forth. So not just sort of drawing from literature summaries of species distributions or whatever. So we were very happy with these results. Uh, we asked another question about whether speciation rates, these more biodiverse, uh, you know, tropical streams, uh, were there, you know, is there a greater speciation rate in these tropical streams and in temperate streams? And this was led by Kelly Zamudio and uh, Nick Pilato at Cornell, but basically uh, they're using a model that I won't go into, but this uh, basically speciation uh, extinction model, okay? And it uses phylogenetic relationships and molecular clock assumptions about rates of speciation. So, what we see here are a couple of things. One, 
that the speciation rate in Ecuador is high and it doesn't overlap much with the, uh, the, the speciation rate as calculated in, uh, in, in Colorado. And then we have this extinction, the difference between these, or this is the uh, extinction rate, which is another parameter produced by the model. And what we see basically is that there's, uh, there is a higher, significantly significant higher speciation rate in Ecuadorian streams and than in Colorado streams for the taxa we looked at. Uh, and it's sort of interesting. Right, but it may be to be expected since we have more diversity, but sort of the the rate of speciation is greater in the tropical streams, probably because of that population isolation, right? And so, anyway, all right, so for the CVH, sort of our, uh, all these results, the, the uh, summary and the synthesis of these results was published here in uh, PNAS paper back in 2018. And uh, the, our conclusions generally are that tropical species, when compared to temperate species, demonstrate, you know, narrower thermal breadths, less gene flow between populations, higher population genetic divergences, and higher species, higher cryptic diversity, and greater speciation rates. So, you know, if we'd gotten the opposite results, it probably wouldn't have been believable, but this sort of fits with our intuition and with, you know, very closely matches the predictions of Janssen. All right, so um, we wanted, in this project, we wanted to be very integrative and actually test some things like the thermal sensitivity, not only the thermal sensitivity of species, but do their, does, do, does their fitness change with changes in temperature? And so fitness, of course, is one of those things that's hard to quantitatively characterize rigorously, but we use growth rate as a correlative fitness, and that's oftentimes done in, uh, in you know, these kinds of studies. So basically we set up, uh, I'll show you. We, uh, we did this in two ways. One, we built these fabulous streamside mesocosms uh, that we uh, used in Colorado and in Ecuador. We used to uh, have temperature treatments uh, in, so we had me these mesocosms. These are, I think I have a picture of this. Uh, you can sort of see it a little bit better here. It's a circular PVC collar that has a center pivot. And so we can get water to circulate. So it's a flow through system. And there's, you know, it's meshed on the top so that species that individuals can't get out. Then inside, we grew algae in the streamside streamside uh, flumes, and we then, I guess I don't have the slide. So in each of these mesocosms, we would put algal food on tiles, you know, to serve as food. Food was not limiting. Uh, and then we had sort of constant flow through, once flow through, and we would warm the, the, these mesocosms through a series by, by warming water uh, in, Ex external tanks and then piping it by treatment through these different mesocosms. And I thought I had a slide that showed someone had a thermal uh, sensitive camera. It was really cool. You could look at these different uh, treatments, cold you know, ambient mesocosm plus two and a half degrees, plus four degrees and see different, very different colors. So, um, you know, this was a lot of, a lot of plumbing, a lot of futzing around. If any of you have ever worked with mesocosms or, you know, in lab like aquaculture or whatever, you know, this, this is, takes a lot of attention to make this work. Uh, I had a couple of postdocs on this. One was Amanda and the other was uh, Andrea Yeda from a postdoc from Spain working in Ecuador and Colorado as it turns out. So anyway, uh, we wanted to test the, uh, oh, here we are, oh, no, I'm sorry. My slides are just a little bit mixed up here, but um, we wanted to test two things. One was whether uh, experimental increase in temperature inside these mesocosms would cause differences in growth rate of populations that were taken from different elevations, okay? Uh, both temperate and tropical. And the second thing we wanted to do was see whether we could do uh, field experiments to do in, like common garden experiments where you transfer species from one elevation to different elevations uh, and look at their growth rates. 
Okay. And I'm not going to talk too much about the mesocosm work. That's just uh, in review right now. It's, it should hopefully be published soon because uh, there's a, a, lot, a lot to describe. Uh, what I want to really talk about is whether uh, we saw what we saw when we did these uh, reciprocal transplants in the field. That's pretty interesting. So we would collect individuals of a certain size range. These are all these insects for growth rate were imaged and you know and um, measured their, their, their length was uh, length length math relationships, and we measured the length at the beginning and the end of the experiment. So uh, in these mesocos in this uh, in situ experiments, we would build these little containers with there and some food in there, tile in there, and we would take populations from high elevation, move them down to low, and conversely, okay. And this is sort of shows some of the uh, some of the field field work. And so, what did we see? Uh, we got here. We've got so using in Colorado this beta bicaudatus and tricaudatus, two different species that have different elevational uh, diff ranges. And andesiops, the morpho species of andesiops in tropical. Okay, and these are our elevations that we took source populations from. Okay, and so we would transfer species from, uh, you know, from high elevation down to lower elevations and, and conversely. Okay, so if we look at the results here, we're looking at elevation on the x axis, low elevation, warmer, high elevation, cooler. And this is the standardized growth rate in, in milligrams per day based on our insect imaging and mass length relationships. And so we see here at the for organisms, for populations, individuals taken from the highest elevation in Colorado, that the growth rate when they were transferred to mid elevation uh, were growth was actually higher at lower elevations than at high elevations. And this is a kind of result that's seen often in, in, uh, in temperate systems. We get some compensation. You get uh, enhanced growth from going from cold environments to warmer environments. Okay. Uh, in terms of the mid elevation, pop populations taken at mid elevation and moved to high elevation had low, uh, you know, not significantly different growth. And at lowest elevation, also similar growth. So the, Organisms taken from mid elevation really didn't, their growth rates didn't change much when put at high or low elevation. And then for, here we go, for, if we take organisms from the lowest elevation and move them to mid elevation or high elevation, we see that the growth rate actually uh, de uh, declines. So, you know, and what, what we're seeing here is not much sort of elevation specific. Uh, dependency in terms of the growth rate when moved to a different elevation, right? Now, in contrast, when we go to the tropical systems, we see that uh, organisms taken from high elevation grow fastest at high elevation. So we don't see that compensatory result of increased growth at low elevation for high elevation populations. Mid-elevation populations grow the fastest at mid-elevation. And Low elevation populations grow fastest at low elevation. So this really strongly suggests a kind of local adaptation, right? Sort of physiological adaptation to the thermal regime. And in the tr tropical systems, we see that local adaptation in the different systems. There's more spreading of more dispersal, more gene flow, less local adaptation. So, um, you know, this is a really cool result, right? Uh, unfortunately, we haven't yet finished writing the manuscript on that one. <laughs> But uh, so th again, this is sort of consistent with uh, you know our expectations. All right. So um, what time do we have? Oh, cool. All right. So basically, uh, if we look at the results, these are previous results. If we look at what we saw in our growth experiments, we see that tropical mayfly growth rates are, you know, quote unquote, adapted to the ambient temperature along this elevation gradient. So, uh, and that as a, as a consequence, perhaps, uh, 
uh, tropical mayflies may be more vulnerable to, well, to warming than temperate zone mayflies uh, because of this local adaptation and sort of a smaller thermal breadth for the tropical, systems, tropical species. Now, uh, so it, it, I don't think I have a slide for this, but interestingly, so in Colorado, the low elevation populations are uh, have a have a, a wider thermal breadth and may be less sensitive to warming a unit of warming than high elevation may populations that have a more narrow thermal breadth. And in Ecuador, it's just reversed. So the low elevation systems have the narrow thermal breadth. And they live in constantly warm waters, and they and they're more likely to be vulnerable to a, a, an increment of of uh, warming, which sort of challenges what's often sort of a you know an assertion that it's based on our temperate zone understanding that you know uh, as temperatures warm, organisms will move up the mountain to you know to stay to keep in their thermal. Uh, sort of thermal conditions that they desire, but in tropical systems, it doesn't necessarily work like that. So I feel like this is really from both a, st a stream perspective and from a more general ecological perspective, these results I think uh, are important. So that's all I have on that. Uh, thank you and I'd be happy to take questions. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. 